I know. Karen, thank you so, so, so very much to join us on Meet Me in the Field and welcome. And it is a Monday evening in somewhere in Australia. Where are you? Sydney? Yeah, in Sydney. 6 p.m. in Australia. Sydney. That's awesome. Sydney Aust- oh, you do a good Aussie accent. Do that again. <laughs> I think that's the only word I can say in an Australian accent. I'm really, really bad with accents. So are you Australian born bred? I am. Yeah, I am. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I find it hard to do a South African accent. I heard this, I heard this South African uh, comedian once years ago, and I was trying to tell my husband at the time the jokes. And I started, I swear, I started channeling a South African accent because it's the accent that I find the most difficult to do. And I was in the car one day just telling him about this South African and I was totally channeling this South African accent. I'm like, oh, my God, where did that come from? (laughs) I must have been channeling the South African (laughs) comedian. Anyway. (laughs) I must tell you this this very weird story. My first year of varsity, I was in a, you know, the varsity is the university, or you call it uni. At the uni I was, we, the, they, they, the day students, they, they, they split it into houses so that you can also feel part of, of university life, just like um, race students do. And the house I was had a mascot of a, um, a crow, no, a, a cock, uh, um, yeah, rooster. a chicken. <laughs> of a rooster. That's a the rooster. Word I'm <laughs> of a rooster. And, um, for, for some other event, they wanted somebody to crow like a rooster. And they lined all the first years up and said, now crow. And from pure fear, and I don't know what, I crowed exactly like a rooster. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I'm sure I channeled it as well. It was, I was so shocked. I can't make the sound. Where did the sound come from? So that night at the event, I had to do it again. And I was so paranoid that I won't be able to, <laughs> to get that sound out of me because I had no idea where it came from. Where it so, came from. Did you manage to do it the same time? <laughs> as if your South African accent was the same. But I think the problem with South African accents is that you get so many of them. We, we are such a diverse culture that there's, there's nothing to say this is a South African accent. I mean, my husband and I speak completely differently because I grew up in Johannesburg. He grew up in Cape Town and we, we speak different Afrikaans. Yeah, so different dialects. It's the same with any language. Australians the same. You'll hear me speak very differently from many Australians who yeah. speak more nasally and you think, G'day, my A gun, you know, like that. So, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, accents all over the world, you know, vary with their different dialects. But there's a certain flavour to the South African <laughs> accent that can kind of, you can turn it up or turn it down. And yours is kind of pretty down, actually. <laughs> It is possibly a, a, a smoky, a smoky bryflaze flavor. That, that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I traveled. My first overseas trip was in 1993. I booked a Kentucky tour, mm-hmm. and we and then did one of these what 18, 21 days or, or whatever it was. And I remember so well arriving in London and meeting the rest of, of the people touring with us. That was the Sunday night. The, the tour was starting on the Monday, and a lot of Australians and New Zealand people. And I kept on thinking, when are they going to start speaking normally? You know, the, the joke is over. And <laughs> I realized that this is what they speak like. <laughs> and then at the end of this trip, I was voted the person that the, the most difficult to understand. Right. Yeah. And I was so angry. This is this is not okay. Listen to those people. I do understand those people. <laughs> But I speak very fast, so that's well, another problem. Well, here in Sydney, we have a really large South African um, population. There are many, many people that have immigrated from South Africa to Australia. To Australia, And I always ask them, one of my best friends, whose name is Karen, uh, is from there. She's been here about 20 years. I always ask them, why did you come? And they always have the same story and for, for an easier life that, you know, as much as they love Mother Africa, they just, yeah. it was difficult, yeah. So yeah. every My one of them. are, are, are waiting to hear if his visa for America has been approved. Right. He got a job during lockdown in California. Oh, right. In, okay. In Silicon Valley. And you're right. You know, once once your once your your feet touched African soil, your soul has touched that as well. So mm. I'm, even though life is going to be very different and much easier for us there, I'm. Um, 
my heart is very, very sore to be leaving Africa. Yeah. Because Mother Africa yeah. definitely has, 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 a, has a touch that few other, other mothers have. Yeah. So, Corin, enough about me. <laughs> I am so excited to, to meet you. I, 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 I must be honest that I think I feel slightly intimidated, <laughs> more than nervous. <laughs> And it's, a, it's quite a hot morning in, in Cape Town and I can't open too many windows because of the sound. So I'm, I might be starting to, to sweat profusely. That's a combination of nerve, nerves and heat. So excuse me for that. I'll try and do it as elegantly as possible so that your YouTube viewers aren't um, disturbed by me wiping the sweat off my brow. Well, I know so, that this is your show, but for those people, because I'm going to upload this to my YouTube, you want to tell people about your show? Yes. Where they my can show- find it? My show is called Meet Me in the Field, and I talk to people about their spirituality and their spiritual journeys. And I became interested in that when I came into recovery from drug and alcohol abuse right. um, and, and did a dance step program and had to find a higher power. Mm. And that's where my interest started. Mm. So um, the podcast comes out to once a week, normally on a Thursday morning in South African time. And I... I am on, I post it on my website, which is www.freddy, double, that is F-R-E-D-D-I-E dot org dot Z. And it's also, I load it on Anchor, which posted to all the major um, YouTube channels. So you'll find it on Spotify and I, and Google Podcast and Apple Podcast and all, yep. all the rest, stick all the audio podcasts, you know, in South yeah. Africa and all those type of places. And I'm really excited to, 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 to have you on board because you sound as if you have had an amazing spiritual journey. <laughs> it's definitely, so. I have. It's definitely been a long spiritual journey. <laughs> people <laughs> often ask me, you know, how did you awaken? And like many of the people, unlike many of the people that I have on my podcast show, it wasn't a... Um, bam, I'm awake. It was a slow burn. It started with questions. And, you know, when I'm speaking to people online at the moment about uh, the mass awakening that we're going through in humanity at large, it is those questions. It's like when you start questioning your reality, that's when you you start to receive the answers, you know. And, And so for me, I was like this kid that was endlessly asking questions like, how can a kid be born in sin if they, you know, these babies, they're just this pure, how can you be born in sin and need to be baptized? That doesn't make sense. And, and why is there hell? And just asking these philosophical questions to my parents, they were not religious. We had no really religious upbringing. I often say to people when they say, what's your religious upbringing? I was a naughty kid. I was a rebellious kid. I was expelled from a couple of schools and, and the the good nuns. (laughs) Me now. <laughs> <laughs> the good art i think a rebellious you know a rebellious spirit is a questioning mind uh, and uh, and the nuns at the at the catholic convent took me in because mum was sick and no other schools would take me in private schools and um i said to mum, what am i going to do about all this religious stuff mum?" she said just ignore it darling you know that's my religious upbringing but i have to say i had a i had a past life memory of being uh persecuted by the church which was this this hangover memory I had in my life. And, and years later, I remember uh, I was dating a guy that was singing in a church and I joined the choir in this church. It was um, not a part of the church. They just used the church as an event space. And I remember having this awful feeling being inside the church. And my guide said to me, you have to forgive the church, Karen. You have to forgive the church. And I'm like, the church has done nothing to me in this life, but it's this hangover memory from past lives of, um, probably being monk, a monk and being radical and wanting to transform the church and the church sort of, you know, saying I'm a heretic or being burnt at the stake as a witch mm-hmm. or who knows how many past lives I've been persecuted by the, the church. Uh, so I had no religious upbringing, but those questions just like, why am I here? What am I here to do? Where do I come from? What's it all about, Alfie? Yeah. Oh, my word. And you said those questions started very early in your life. Very early. And they ramped up. So I'm like a 12, 13, 14 year old mum sick and she dies when I'm 16. And Mm. I'm asking different questions like, why do people get sick? Why? There is this massive thunderstorm happening outside. It's really beautiful, actually. The the earth is shaking, Freddie. Anyway, it's like, why do people get sick? It's me. I I, I just have that effect. (laughs) 
<laughs> you're shaking the earth, honey. Um, yeah. And what happens when you die? When she dies, I'm like, why, where did she go? And, and can I talk to her again? And if she went somewhere, uh, well, you know, she must have been there before she got here. So w- what is that place? And, and those questions just asked, I was speaking to my group online this, this morning, my morning, um, talking about just devouring spiritual books because uh, one of them was saying that she's devouring books on ETs and then she read a book that had quite a negative connotation on ETs and she feels quite uh, down because um, she has this passion to learn more about extraterrestrials and she feels like, uh, you know, this person was quite negative about them that she should have done. I said, you know, follow your bliss, as Bashar says, follow your highest excitement. That highest excitement is your soul talking to you. So for me, even though I loved going out and partying and, you know, buying clothes and d- dancing at the disco and all that stuff, my highest excitement was sitting at home reading spiritual books, which nobody in my uh, you know, upbringing or my age group understood, I would just sit there and devour spiritual books, not understanding wow. that that was my soul speaking to me about who I am and why I'm on the planet. And so many people can relate that are devouring podcasts because now, you know, this was before the internet and listening yeah. to podcasts like yours and mine and others and just devouring this information. That's your soul speaking to you about who you are and why you're here. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. And I read up on your on your bio on your website that you saw the what shall we call it the all seeing eye the third eye when you started right from from your start of meditation journey yeah and I remember yeah. when I was in rehab I was also for the first time introduced to, to to meditation and I constantly saw this purple this purple color yeah it was always just this and I, I I still don't really know what it means. It, it, it's not. It's not that important that it has. To, that it has to have a meaning. I was just fascinated by it, and every now and then it still comes up. But I love third eye meditations, so that's why I was fascinated. Fascinated by by hearing your story, and that was. Am I correct if I if I interpret it as as if that was your your awakening? That that was what what, what started your, your 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 process into intuitive. Um, what shall we call it, intuitive, being in touch with intuition and being in touch with your guides and all those type of things? Or or did it come earlier? I think it came earlier. By the time I saw that third eye, I was investigating channelers. So I I took my friend to see this channeler uh, and, um, who was kind of on the fringe she was interested in this stuff and we were young we're in our 20s and she was a trance channeler so she would she would go into a different personality and um even though my bs meter was off the richter scale when she like i'm i'm like questioning like what is this whole channeling thing about i had already read shirley mclean's books and you know in shirley mclean's book she talks about the channeler Uh, have you read many of shirley mclean's material uh, she talks no, about really. see a, a, a trance channeler that came to her house and, and did a channeling session for her. And I'm like, oh, what's this channeling stuff about? And then I, um, I, I started doing some of her courses. And I remember saying to her, like, I see this big eye when I shut my eyes. I've got this eye looking back at me. And uh, she wasn't the best teacher, this woman. She was kind of, she was a bit frustrated with me because I, I kind of had, I had questions to things that she didn't have answers to. And uh, I think she was frustrated with me. So like many people uh, on their spiritual awakening, I was just so full of questions. Like, why is this happening? Why, why, why? I bet you were the same, Freddie, when you started seeing this purple color, like, why is this happening? What does it mean? And um, I went to see many healers and teachers and, and channels and psychics and stuff like that. And many of them gave me that same, uh a same advice in different ways they were saying be more feminine and i'm like what or access your feminine more access your femininity that many of them were talking to me about this i remember going to see this woman who lived a few hours away and i was wearing this goddess outfit with my sparkly shoes and she, again out of her mouth she said you've got to develop your feminine side more and i remember thinking in my head are you serious? Have you seen my sparkly shoes? <laughs> she looked down at my shoes. She read my mind how and she said, <laughs> yeah, how much more feminine can I get? I like your shoes. 
But what they were trying to say without being succinct, I had to sort of work it out, was we're, all, we're both feminine and masculine, all of us, right? And so the masculine part of us is the thinker. It is the, it is the, it is the questioner. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful part of us. It's the one that wants to work things out. It's the one that loves the puzzles, you know, like and putting the puzzle pieces together. Like television shows are full of sleuth, you know, whodunit shows. They, we want to mm-hmm. think, we want to work it out, we want to be logical about it. That's our that masculine aspect. And I was very much like that, the questioner and the logic. Uh-huh. And so what they were saying is be more feminine. So what's feminine is like be more intuitive. So the intuitive part of us is the part of us that relaxes and receives so when you're receiving oh. information and i say this with my students uh when you're in, 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 receiving intuitive guidance it's not like you're thinking it you the more relaxed you are and you can just open to receive it's given to oh. you it's like it's get, visions are given to you just like your purple or the eye so that's why meditation is such an important part of the spiritual journey mm-hmm. it's to relax the mental noise the part of you that wants to work things out that wants to think 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 so that you can surface in the head <laughs> in your head yeah and so really what they were saying it wasn't about wearing sparkly shoes or long dresses it was about developing that intuition intuition okay, young. and finally enough i came into this world kind of dumbed down on the logical side i was really dyslexic as a kid but incredibly creative so i could draw anything um, but okay. not so great at math or reading and so there's my soul <laughs> you got your hand up my soul <laughs> was really saying we want you to develop your psychic abilities your intuitive abilities we don't want you to get lost in the mind so we can get so lost in our intellect yeah. and and study and think and study and it's delicious, but it, it, they wanted my 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 higher self or my guides really wanted me to develop that intuitive mm. side and expand those psychic abilities and really that's what I teach people now because I think on a on a global in a glo- global mm. way we're doing that we're yeah. moving to a more intuitive society a more um transparent society where telepathy is going to be a a way that we're going to start to communicate in future societies and so we all have to start expanding and 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 developing our our feminine side or intuition or psychic abilities yeah i'm quickly going to do something which might cause a noise or something just because i pick up that my light is reflecting in your glasses. So for the people who see a round, no, it's actually not my light. No, it's my light reflecting in my glasses. It's your light. (laughs) It's my light. (laughs) Because it's it's twilight here. It's it's dark here, so I've got the lights on. (laughs) Yeah, you're like kind of ruined my glasses. I'm going to jump. It's weird. I, I never... I never prepare questions. I, I believe that the conversation needs to go with where it goes. But because I didn't know anything about you, I just quickly scanned some, some stuff about you. You wrote two books. And I, I want to start the question about the books from two, two different places. The one is that I suffered terribly from dyslexia. But you wrote two books. So isn't yeah. that an amazing inspirational story for anybody who, who might be suffering from dyslexia? So I Absolutely. think that, that that's already a, what a beautiful thing to say, look what I've done. You know? so, so people with dys- dyslexia, listen to this woman. She, you can do it. <laughs> okay, number one. And number two is both of your books deal with the topic of, 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 of death. They do. Yeah. And, and does that relate to, to, your, to your mom's early, early death? Or, or, or how, did, how did that happen? Look, absolutely, Freddie. You know, what happened when mum died is that I had for many years before I realised I was sort of like tapped into my intuitive, intuition and psychic ability, I was dreaming about her. I would see her in the dream. You know, when you have a dream and you don't realise that you're in a dream in the dream, you think it's your reality. So I would see her somewhere. I would go to someone's house and there she would be sitting on the couch. And I'm like, what are you doing here? And she said, you know, I'm here. And I'm like, but you're dead. And she's like, yeah. I didn't, I didn't die, Karen. I'm like, 
no, you're dead. You died. You know, and so I'm in this confusion in the dream because I think I'm in some reality. And that happened over and over and over again. But death was such a constant companion for me. It started when I was a kid, but people just like <laughs> dropping. I've had so many close friends and relatives die. Mm -hmm. Best friends commit suicide and people well, die of cancer. Hmm? In murder, she wrote. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see the, the, the television series Murder, She Wrote with Jessica Fletcher? Mm -hmm. It was in South Africa. So this, this is an old lady who was a kind of a, 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 a investigator. But whenever she went away anywhere, somebody will die. Oh, so, right. <laughs> so Jessica Fletcher. So yeah, you I were like Australian Jessica Fletcher. If you arrive somewhere with you, you know that somebody's going to die this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Maybe no, not. but that's terrible. But, so from a young age, you were confronted with a with sense of, of, of death, dying, loss. Yeah, but the truth is, Freddie, there is no death and there is no loss. And this is okay. what mum was trying to translate to me, you know, transmit to me when she would say, I didn't die, Karen. I didn't die. And I would, in my linear human mind, I would be, but you're dead. You're dead. And she's like, I didn't die. She said it over and over and over again. And so just like all my best friends, like I had a few best, best friends. One I grew up with, she was born thalidomide affected. She died at 40 and she came a couple of years after she died. And I'm hanging out with her in another realm, having a chat. And I looked at her and I said, hang on, what am I doing talking to you? Aren't you dead? And she goes, no, I didn't die. And so all my dead friends came to tell me they didn't die and that there is no death. And uh, so when I was asking my guides, I really wanted to make a movie because writing a book didn't seem like a possibility to me because I was not really a writer, like the dyslexic thing, right? And um, I'm like, what, what will I make a documentary about? I really want to sort of put out some information that's going to help people. And um, I was stressing about it. And my guide said, oh, God, Karen, stop stressing. Just write about what you know. What do you know? And I said, well, I know about death. And they said, write about that. So I sat down and it literally took me two weeks to just spew out this information that just sort of funneled through me, cha channeled through me oh, as memory, I suppose, just channeling. Um, it wasn't my whole story. It was just my story around death. People that had died and people, again, that I had met that had told me um, stories of their near-death experiences and what they experienced and, and um, just sort of speaking to that. Uh, what I knew was that everyone that had died had come to tell me I didn't die, there is no death. So I'd had okay. that message so many times. Oh. So I called that book Return to Love and I you know, wrote that probably about, well, I don't know, 16 years ago now. And then okay. the next book I put out is part of a series. Uh, and I noticed on my podcast shows, Freddie, that every time I put on someone who speaks about a near-death experience, I get the most amount of hits every time. Okay. And so I figured that people are seeking what happens when you die. Like death is a subject. Yeah. My guide said to me when I said, what am I going to write about? I said, what I know is about death. I thought, you know, the thing that causes the most pain in this world is the perceived loss of a loved one. Like death is the thing that causes most people yeah. pain. Grief, they call it grief. And so I wanted to address that. Like I wanted to address what causes the most amount of pain. So then you're going to be speaking about death. <clears throat> and then yeah. also through the podcast, noticing that there are just so many people Googling what happens when you die. Because uh, like no one's getting out of here alive and everyone will brush yeah. up with death at some point. It's a rare person. I had a woman stay in my house once years ago who was 60 and she'd never had anyone close to her die. And I thought, gee, that's rare. You. That's really rare. But her mother, funnily enough, at the time was sick and she had to cut her trip short and go back to the States because she was probably going to, you know, see the transition of her mother. When you're in your 60s, your parents usually kind of, you know, like exit the matrix because yeah. they're probably in their 80s at that point. Yeah. And, yeah, so we're all going to brush up with death. And it's just so much better when you understand that they're not lost to you, your loved ones. They're there. You can talk to them. Uh, the, 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 the relationship continues. Uh, it continues both in a psychic way, but also in a physical way. I've um, like mum's back on the planet and I'm having a relationship with her in another body. And, you know, it's just a continuum. This life is yeah. just one drop in the ocean of the eternal story of our soul. And, there, and if, you can, if you can get in touch with the continuum 
of who you are as a soul rather than focusing on who you are as a personality, this body, this these desires, you know, what I want out of my life, this now moment. This now moment yeah. encompasses your past life, your future lives, your spiritual lives, your galactic lives. We are multidimensional. And if we can get intimate with our multidimensional selves, then we really expand our idea of who we are and why we're here. And we have a sense of our true nature. So ah. the, the desires of the personality wanting, I don't know, not to be lonely or more money or a better house or a better job, you know, we get so caught up with that being who we are, but we're so much greater than that, Freddie. We're so yeah. much greater than these tiny desires for a better <laughs> lifestyle, or, you know, yeah. or a healthier body. I mean, all that's important as a physical being, but we're so much greater than that. We're, we're these multidimensional beings here as you are, as anyone listening to this podcast, as anyone listening to my shows. We're here as a part of the expansion in human consciousness, the shift in yugas, the shift in eras. We're the transition team and we're oh, here to help people I love know, remember who they are as multidimensional facets of the extension of source energy, their power, their brilliance, their infinite creative potential. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Julie Ryan? Julie Ryan. Julie Ryan, no. R Y A N. She calls herself a medical intuitive, mm -hmm. and she wrote she wrote a book about the the process of transition. She right. she discovered that, that 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 she that she can channel for people to to experience the dying process, mm -hmm. and 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 she, she she breaks the dying process into twelve into twelve steps, and she can tell you at any stage, if you contact her, she can intuitively tell you where in the die, dying process your loved one is. Um, so that, that I spoke to her on my podcast, so it is the Ask, Ask Julie Ryan. I think I called her the medical intuitive. Quite a fascinating lady. So that was your, 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 your writing about death and the transition period. I thought that was quite quite interesting as well. Um, so, so the first book was Return to Love. And, and the second one, Awakened by Death. Yeah, which is a compilation of people's stories, mine being one of them, about how death was their awakener. So you asked okay. me, you know, what, was it that meditating, the awakener? I think that even though I had questions when I was a kid, like, like why do babies need to be baptised and all that sort of stuff, yeah. it was those questions when mum died that really ramped up, that really um, accelerated, uh, you know, turned up the volume on my questions that that made me seek more poignant answers. So yeah. I guess that her death was really my awakener. Uh, although, okay. again, it was a slow burn because I'm still sort of focused on getting a job and finding a boyfriend and all that stuff that we, you know, we're here to do. But <laughs> sort of my secret life was i got to get the answer to these questions, read a book, read a book, read a book. <laughs> <laughs> but her coming to me in dreams over and over and over again those dreams stopped when I was in my 30s so I'm about 16 when she died and I'm in my 30s probably mid 30s when I started doing energy healing courses and I started to get a handle I was getting much more expand on view on who I am and what's possible and when I did those dreams stopped except that when my best friend killed herself mm. I was, um, uh, I was a young mum, a single mum at the time. I was doing all manner of healing courses and I was in the shower one afternoon. It was Christmas time and I was taking my little daughter to, she was in a, a, a school, you know, play at the end of the year, all dressed up as a lion or something anyway. And I had a student living with me who was a Japanese woman. Normally they're young kids, but this woman was in her fifties. She was so gorgeous. And she'd come to Australia to learn English. Anyway, she was living with me, paying me a bit of rent and helping me out as a single mum. And I was in the shower one day and I was exhausted. I needed to get dinner. I had to go and pick up Annika's costume. I needed to get to school by 5.30 and blah, 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 and feed mm -hmm. her and feed my student. And, and I just thought, I'm just going to get in the shower and just take five minutes and just like, just sit at the bottom of the shower, let the water run over me and just chill for, just for five minutes. Yeah. And then I'll get back into the busyness of my day. And as I did this, 
I closed my eyes and I saw my mother's face in profile. So just her head in profile as clear as day in my third eye. And I'm like, oh, like what? Mum, you're here. It was so real. And I remember opening my eyes thinking, I don't have time for this now. <laughs> like I've, I've, got, I've got stuff to do. I don't have time to talk to my yeah. dead mother. Because <laughs> <And laughs> I remember it was her profile and she turned and looked at me, right, and she didn't say anything. She just looked at me, just her floating head. And I just opened my eyes trying to stop the phenomena from happening. And as I opened my eyes, I had this my other senses were engaged I could smell her I could feel her like the memory of her just came flooding back she'd been dead for you know a good 16 years I suppose or or maybe 20 years at that point and I just had this visceral sensation of her like I don't know when you're with someone when you're at the company like when you're with your your husband There is this sense of knowing them that you feel like you know you're there in Mm. you're in their presence physically, right? That was the sensation I was having. It was like she was standing physically next to me. Every sense was engaged. Um, I could smell her, and I just remember thinking, "Oh my god!" I remember, like I remember what it felt like to be in her presence. Oh my word! Yeah, it was extraordinary. No fear. No fear, but I was in my busy mind and I was thinking, um, remember I said you have to relax to receive that. I have been relaxed enough, just like, oh, I'm just going to chill out to like the phenomena to happen. But when it started happening, I started to resist it. Like, no, I don't have time for this. And I Mm. jumped out of the shower and I just said, I just don't have time to this. You know, you've come to tell me something, but I'll call you back all right because I've got to get dinner on. (laughs) And I just I jumped. Love that. I, I love jumped the arrogance out. of the human being. <laughs> I know. I know. Anyway, the next morning, it was around four o'clock in the afternoon. The next morning, my ex-husband called me to tell me that my bed fr- best friend had committed suicide. And it was at that time no. that she, her body was found, exactly at that time. Oh so word. mom had come to tell me, uh, you know, something, but I didn't listen. But there was such a powerful communication from the other side in my waking, you know, rather than it being a Mm. dream when I was asleep at night in my waking sense. And it was really around that time that I stopped having those dreams about her because I had access to her like that, you know. And and so I I didn't need to dream about her anymore because most Mm. of us don't realize we have access to our loved ones. And so we, they contact us in our dreams because in our waking life, we're in our busyness and we go, I yeah. can't speak to dead people. I'm not psychic, but we all are. Like we all are, <laughs> every one of us. I yeah. met my, my spirit animal in, in a meditation once. Also, I just sat down and closed my eyes and went into whatever zone it was. And next minute, exactly like you, like your mom, just, 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 just the head, just right. be appeared kind of bear. right in front of me. Yeah. yeah. And he, he, he looked at me straight in the eye. And my first thought was, you should be shitting yourself. <laughs> this, is not, this is not normal. This is not okay. Be scared. Be afraid. And the bed turned his head kind of really inquisitively looking at me. And then opened his mouth as if he was talking. Obviously, I, I couldn't hear. And then when, when the real consciousness of, of fear needing to be the option overtook he disappeared and wow. i've never seen him again but well, you was can I if fascinated? you want to. <laughs> it, it, that's what i'm hearing from you so i'm definitely going to to, 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 to channel mr bear again but what a fascinating experience it was such a beautiful experience how how do you how do you channel is is, is there a, a, a ritual is there a process or, absolutely or is not not you, you, you know ritual it's and process part, it's just part of you Ritual and process is all a part of the linear human mind that feels like it needs to undergo some ritual or process in order to get what it wants. It's the, it's the, it's the logical, it's the masculine, it's the doing part of the mind. 
and and we've grown up with ritual and process especially inside religions there's so many you know ritual and process and even even religion when you look at african type religions zulu and you know how they have all these rituals and processes and and um in order to conjure the spirits or you know they they're dancing and they put feathers and some of them are killing animals and sacrifices you know that's but here's the thing intention lined up with alignment like when you have an intention and a passion and you align your energy manifestation of anything happens easily and simply so if you have an intention or a desire to want to channel or contact your dead relatives or speak to your higher self or channel your spirit animal all you need is a a desire to do it a willingness to do it and then to know one that you can so we need ritual to give us this belief that if I do this process, that is going to activate the spirits, that's going to conjure the spirits or call on the spirits, and then I'm going to be able to do it. Give me the ABCs, please. Give me the process. Give me the ritual. But it's not necessary. It really isn't. I have access to my mob 24-7. I ask a question. If I'm not too much in the vibration of the question, I'm receiving the answer. So it's, it's in those times when you're asking something and you so want to know the answer, you're not a vibrational match to the, like when you're, yeah. so wanting, when you're in the question, you're not a vibrational match to the answer because the frequency of the answer is different to the frequency of the question. So think about when you're questioning something, you are in a sort of fraught, um, agitated sort of state when you like, I can't find my keys or I can't understand this or why did that happen? Why? It's sort of more tense. There's a tension. So as soon as you relax that tension and you go into I don't need to know. Doesn't matter. It'll come to me when it's time. You know, you you mm. just you just relax. You just relax. Yeah. Now you're in a vibrational match to the answer. And the answer might be I want to channel. And you've got to ask what you want to channel and be a vibrational match to that. Yes. So you can channel anything and there's many energies out there that you can channel. But I never talk about protection from evil spirits or dark spirits or pesky spirits because it depends on what you're a vibrational match to. So if you're not angry or upset or stressed or have a dominant vibration of resentment, you've had terrible things happen in your life and you're carrying a lot of guilt, shame or resentment, and then you start Mm. channeling, now you're a vibrational match to that sort of frequency. But if you've cleaned up your vibration, you've forgiven you know, your family and mm. forgiven yourself for the things that you've done and, yes. and you've done all the work, the inner work, and you see yourself as a being of love and light and you love yourself and you love life. Now, when you reach out to the universe, you're only a vibrational match to that same frequency or a similar frequency of love and light. So you're more yeah. of a match to the angels or the archangels or your higher self or your guides, or your spirit animals, awesome, yeah. your ET friends. Uh, so yeah, so there's a lot of psychics out there that are channeling all sorts of different energies, but you've got to ask yourself, what are their vibrational match to? Cause it's all about yes. how we align energy, what we're a match to. So awesome. having an intention and alignment of that desire with the frequency you're looking for, bang, you've got it. So awesome. it's really easy. And I get people talking to their spirit guides and channeling like in seconds. It's just. Well, I am going to try that later today to, to, to call Mr. Bear in, in, to do me again. You yeah. mentioned something really important. And, and it is such a big question in life. And that is. How do I come to love myself? Ah, so well. What, what, what advice, what feedback, what, what can you tell us in that regard? Well, here's the thing. <laughs> One of the biggest questions out there, just like that on a Monday evening to you, Karen. <laughs> How could you not love yourself, really? You are an extension of pure positive energy. You are an extension of the source. Source is an energy. It is pure positive liquid love, liquid light, infinite creative I love potential. That you love, are light. connected to the field of all possibility. You know, we could talk about this 
in a spiritual way. We could talk about it in a quantum way, in a scientific way. It all comes down to the same thing. You are connected to an energy that is you. It's not I'm connected to an energy that's something outside of myself. That yeah. flow of energy, that flow of bliss, that flow of excitement is you. And then everything that's contrary to that is a made up story. So the thought, the thought that mm. underpins every negative idea, uh, every fear based idea is this idea of I am not worthy or I am not enough. And when you understand that that is impossible, if you are an extension of God or the source or the creator of all things, how could you ever not be enough? How could that be possible? So just a, appealing to the logical mind, it doesn't make sense to hate yourself because hate is contradictory to who you are, whether you hate yourself or others. So if you see yeah. yourself not as your body that you dislike about your body or your age or what you dislike about who you are in some way. And you see yourself as source, as an actor on a stage of life, like Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and we are the actors on the stage. If you see the personality, the body, the everything about yourself as the role that you're playing, as God playing a role, and you identify more with the higher self or beautiful Paul Selleck, you know, talks about, who's a channel, fabulous channel, who talks about the upper room. If you live in the upper room rather than in the divine mind or the greater self, rather than identifying yourself with the little self, which is the part of you that criticizes and judge and worries and mm. hates this part of yourself. And, oh, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not slow enough. I'm not intelligent enough that I'm not enough story. Yeah, It's a bogus story. So when you start to question your stressful thoughts, you really come back to the truth of who you are. How could you be, if you are God, how could you be not enough of anything? I remember writing an article on this saying enough is enough. We just, <laughs> all this I'm not enough stuff. You're like enough is enough. Yeah. It, it, and so you can just come at it at a very, from a very logical perspective. How yeah. could you, how could you believe your stressful thoughts? And that's all not loving yourself is, is believing a story a bogus story <clears throat> that you've come up with or your parents have come up with or your lineage have come up with or the story mm. that you, mm. you've been conditioned by your church or your religion or your society that says that, you know, their God is, a, is an essence outside yourself and, and you yeah. compared to, he's usually a, a guy, a dude, you compared to him <laughs> are so small and little and you're so unworthy of his love unless you do some ritual. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. believe, or believe some laws. Mm. You bring up so many things in, in that answer. The one is that during lockdown in South Africa, we had a hard lockdown from the 28th of March until somewhere in June. In that period, I did a William Whitecloud course, to Create Your Destiny. Yeah. And it's all about bringing your, 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 yourself into being more intuitive, into your intuitive space. And right. um, it starts with, we have to accept that everything we think we know about ourselves is not true. And what, 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 what I got from that was that, and, and you, you brought that up in terms of, 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 of the, 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 the um, 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 ancestral beliefs, mm. is when I started my own practice, I, I was so nervous. I, I just believed that I can't do this, that I... I was nervous to write emails. My whole life, I was nervous to write emails. I was, I was always afraid that it's not, that somebody's going to pick up a spelling mistake. I'm writing in English and I'm actually an Afrikaans speaker, that there's going to be language errors and, 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 and. It was all kind of, you're not good enough to do this and this big worry. And those are all, I'm going to, to, to call a spade a shovel here, and it's all bullshit that, that, that belief systems that, that, that I just um, built up about myself. Which the truth is that that I'm actually a bloody awesome guy, and bloody awesome people make spelling mistakes, and yeah. bloody awesome people make language errors, and it it, it just part of who I am. And a friend of mine helped me out of it by by doing a, a matrix a matrix reimprinting session, mm -hmm. and that was such a beautiful process for me. Where I came out of that, and I thought, no, 
I've handed all these false beliefs back to my ancestors. I'm cool. And yeah. I started building up a practice. And I'm really so happy that I've done that. Yeah. And there's a British psychiatrist, Marissa Peer. I don't know if you've, if you've heard of her. Yeah, she's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's, for, for me, when I, when I hear I am enough, I think of Marissa. And I actually bought myself a Christmas gift from my husband. <laughs> oh, you bought her, her, her work? Her uh, no, I, I bought myself a ring. Oh, a that ring. That says I am enough. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had stickers printed and I have these um, 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 badges um, made of I am enough, I am enough, because we all go through life believing we're not enough. And as you say, you know, we, we are all God. And if we're God, how can we not be enough? No, that, exactly. that's not possible. Exactly. But I'm the type of person, I actually need to remind myself of that. Because I well, here's the thing. I want to give you a really, a really, 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 really important um part a component of of the work uh doing this work so Please when, do. when you push against anything so if if god is all that is that means god is all that is so that means the good the bad and the ugly right so why would god be the evil like from this polarized contrasting linear mind perspective we believe in good and bad in what I want and what I don't want. It's a polarized, opposing uh, world that we've created to explore and experience separation. But if God is all, then God is the good and the bad. So yeah. why resist any of it? So when you're wanting to release or let go of ideas that you say, you know, are bullshit, like if I'm God, how can I be, a, how can I have believed that belief for so many years that I'm not enough yeah. when I am an extension of the source? It just doesn't make sense. But how did that serve you? So let's look at my dyslexia. So I'm this dyslexic kid who's just struggling at school, could draw and paint anything, can't read or write, right? So my, my higher self or soul or guides had created this limitation in order for me to develop my psychic, creative, intuitive aspect. Mm. Once I developed that, my intellect came back online. So now I read things really well and I actually co correct people's punctuation. And like I'm always rewriting people's um, intros. They'll send me their intro and I'll think such bad language and I'll be like correcting it like a teacher. Like I'm the total opposite of who I was as a kid, this yeah. kid. Because once it served me to be dyslexic, so rather than push against it and say, I don't want to be like this anymore, like I can say, thank you, dyslexia. Thank you, limitation, for giving me mm. that experience. Because I had that experience of the limitation of my intellect, I developed my intuition or my creative yeah. mind. And because Absolutely. you had that experience of feeling not enough, which was an experience we all go through, I don't think anyone's listening to this podcast who hasn't felt not enough in some area of their life, whether yeah. that's been you meet someone that you like and then you worry, am I, am I good enough oh, for them? Weird, am I yeah. enough? You know, or... Mm. Or the job, or can I do it? Am I enough? Can I? Am I intelligent enough? Am I good enough? Talented enough? We've all explored the not enough story, right? Yeah, but so. if we hadn't explored that story, we would never have reached for more for to understand who I am to expand. I have yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that not enough story. I'm sure it was a part of your addiction story, and that addiction story brought you oh. to to God, basically. And then you started mm. exploring spirituality. And here you are with yeah. a podcast show and a practice. So very, very true. You th you can so thank that not enough story as a oh. part of your human journey, rather than saying. It's BS, I don't want that in my life. That's resistance yeah. and what you resist persists. But you can Absolutely. thank it and say, thanks mm, for the I ride. Do. Yes. Like, thanks so, for the ride. So, so nice. Yeah. Yeah. Karen, three things to end up with. Number one is, I'm so happy that I read on your bio about the capital A in your name. It fascinated me, fascinated me from day one. First, I thought you made a, 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 a typo. A typo. And then, no, this is a consistent typo. So this isn't yeah. a typo. This is meant to be. But I, I really, I was so intrigued by why is this? So I'm very, very happy that I've read it. So I don't know whether I'm actually pronouncing your name correctly. What is the correct pronunciation? 
Well, you are because South Africans do. It's so funny. My South oh, African cool. girlfriend from Johannesburg, she her name is Karen, and her mother was insistent that people call her Karen and not Karen because in South Africa ah. you say Karen, you know, with yeah. the hard A. And oh, yes. it was my mother's insistence that people spell my, my say my name with the hard A, calling me Karen instead of Ooh. Karen. So I was at school with five Karens and mum um, would not have anyone calling me Karen. If people called me Karen, <laughs> she would correct them. She'd say, no, it's car as in motor car. And she'd do the broom broom oh, sound, awesome. you know, car like motor car. <laughs> and I'd be like, stop mum from doing the broom broom sound. But, you know, I, I never understood as a kid why she was so insistent. And then as I'm on my spiritual journey, I realized that the hard A is actually the sound of the heart chakra. So when you're toning the chakras, the ah yeah. sound okay. is, opens yeah. the heart. So when you say awesome. a hard A, and South African yeah. her language has lots of hard A's, which is really yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> ah, you know, ah, yeah. So that hard A actually opens the heart chakra. And also I found out later that in Egyptian, I'm very connected to Egypt, lots of past lives in Egypt, they, they call the soul the car body spelt ka pronounced car as in motor car the vehicle okay. in which the essence of you reincarnates into different lives you could call it the mm. soul like your soul incarnates into all different life they call that yeah. body that energetic body the car body and so that fascinated okay. me as a young girl thinking you know i'm really connected to my car essence which is the essence of me that is that beyond the physical form it is that mm. energetic form that knows it is greater than just the physical form it has many physical forms yeah. and you know it's exploring all time and space and through many physical forms Famous. yeah so yeah, there was a bit of you know method in her madness mum insisting yeah. people call me karen but people still call me karen especially americans they think oh that's just your cute australian course, accent yeah. and they say you know hi karen how are you and they and i just don't correct them i'm like oh you know it's, read it on the website yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like freddie did if you can do it, like anybody freddie can did. Do it. Yeah, exactly. the second thing is is that a cat that i'm seeing moving around you yeah even, 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 even though then i think was that a pearl? Was that a cat? So <laughs> is, is, is it there with you? Him, her, it, I'm, I'm a cat person. So show me. Oh, it's a big cat. black. Hello. What's your name? He's actually got a little white look. He's got a little white collar there. Oh, cool. Oh, that's good. What's your name? His name is Drake. He was um, he was uh, my neighbours. There's a, there's a story. You want to hear the story of the cat? Go I'll, for it. I I'll love cat you. stories. I'll tell you. <clears throat> so I've had three black cats. They've all been the same soul. Uh, the, the second black cat I had for 20 years and she was a female oh. and she died. I, I used to joke because cats aren't supposed to live that long. And I used to say, when are you going to die? You've been here too long. You're not supposed to live yeah. that long. And my da daughter used to say, you're so mean, mum. You're so mean. And I'm saying, I'm just joking. And I said to the cat, look, look it. I, I don't want the illness thing. I'm not going to take you to the vet. I don't want you to get cancer and all this sort of stuff that oh. old cats get. <sighs> I said, when you're ready to leave your body, you just leave your body. Like you just go, you have permission. Yeah. I'm not going to hang on to you. Like, please don't die. Understanding yeah. there is no death. So Amichi was out here, you know, the hunging mother. She was, a, you know, how many years ago? Probably about five years ago now. She was out here, you know, doing, do you know who the hugging mother is? She's this Indian mm -hmm. saint who just, uh, she sits and she hugs everyone. She does this transmission. And sometimes she'll see okay. like thousands of people at a time. Anyway, she's pretty amazing. So I thought, well, I'll go and see the hugging mother. And I remember that night I fed the cat. She ate, she walked out. So I didn't have to put her outside. And I thought, oh, that was easy. She, she went outside and I shut the door and went out. I came back that night. She was not here, but I had an Italian family living next door with kids and they loved her and she used to hang out there. And I thought, she's next door. The next day I'm on the computer as usual. She's not here in the morning. I'm thinking she's, she stayed next door. Anyway, the neighbor comes over and she says, I think your cat has died. It basically walked oh. outside, went under a tree and left its body. She just left. Oh, she just that simple. Anyway, you know, when people die, you start sort of thinking, oh, I hope I was good to them. I hope I was good enough. We go into the enough story, mm -hmm. right? And I was sitting up in bed thinking about my daughter telling me how mean I was because I kept saying, when are you going to die? And I'm like, but I'm only joking. I'm like, I hope I was nice enough. I hope I petted her enough. Oh. Having a bit of a guilt trip. 
And then I had this dream that night of her leaving her body and seeing this little cat body rise up like this and then do a U-turn and come straight back down again. And I woke up in the morning thinking, oh, she's reincarnated already. She's like not even got to heaven. She's just on a U-turn and come straight back down. And I thought, isn't that nice? She's, you know, she's (laughs) going to be with another family. She's come back in another little black cat body. Mm. That's so nice because I'm not going to get another cat. I've done the cats, right? Four weeks later, Mm. Freddie, (laughs) this cat shows up in my garden and I live above the road. So I've got this little tiny patch of garden. Uh, which is not that accessible to the road as a kitten, like this kitten shows up and and I'm like, are you serious? And it turns out the next door neighbor's son has come to live with him. He's got kicked out of his house. He's got these two cats. One's a kitten. He's just picked up, you know, days before. Mm. And then he leaves and he leaves the cats with my next door neighbor. And then the next door neighbor leaves a year or two later. And he says, do you want the cats? (laughs) And so, the cat came back that's you know if you've got a (laughs) sacred agreement with a person or an animal even if you've made decisions like i did i'm not getting another cat it's gonna it's gonna come back and and so this little guy came back in a male form this time with a bit of white on him he came back yeah like we've got four four cats Mm. yeah also my my we had two gingers and mine passed away 19th of december last year and I don't know how it happened, but we just accumulated cats since then. And a friend of mine said the other day, isn't it awesome that Tyson was such a well, lovely cat that you had to replace him with three others? <laughs> <laughs> and and all, frankly, three them, what, <laughs> all three of them could be the same soul of one. They are just wonderful. One is pitch black, one is pure white, and one is a great tabby. And they're all just awesome. And now let's end up with the... Tell us about your podcast. How did that let, happen? And let me you, just ask you, you, are, you are you going to take the cats to America with you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. As yeah. my husband says, I'd rather, I'd rather leave Freddie behind than to, than to leave one of the cats behind. So, <laughs> no, they are definitely going. They're our children. We can't leave them behind. Definitely not. <laughs> well, well, about so tell us about podcast. your podcast. Well, you know, about 12 years ago, or even longer, I was thinking about, you know, I was teaching deliberate creation to people about how that how we, you know, when we clean up our negative emotions, it's like I've talked about our negative ideas of ourselves and, and, um, and clean up our vibration, how we have more access to being a vibrational match to what we want in life, like how we are the creators of our own reality, both from a spiritual perspective, but from a a human perspective too like we can we can manifest all those human desires like money and houses and trips and all that stuff if we want to jobs Uh, but really it's what the soul is wanting from the physical world experience that's more important than the houses but the soul never says you can't have that you can have that but anyway so it's teaching deliberate creation i'd been i had done a healing course and i realized that um one of the most powerful ways to control a population is through hypnosis, right? And that media mm-hmm. media creates a theta brainwave, which bypasses the logical mind, which likes to question and goes straight into the subconscious. Children live in a theta brainwave most of the time. That's why they're easy to teach and, and put impressions. You know, you can tell a child something and it'll become a belief. It just yeah. bypasses their logical mind that's going to question it. And, and so when I realized that humanity had been so conditioned through our media system, which pumps out fear, 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 and more fear. Mm -hmm. I felt that it was so important to teach people through media about how we are the creators of our reality. And, um, and we have to really be focused on how we feel in order to understand how we're creating our world. And I remember saying to a friend of mine who was psychic, I really think, I'd like to start a radio show, like talking to people on radio and using media that has been used to dumb us down. I want to use it to lift up, lift up, oh, wow. lift, yeah. lift us up. That was the intention. We started the show. We were on uh, mainstream radio, and um, then I moved to a bigger station. I was on mainstream radio for about five years on commercial um, community radio. And, uh, and then I took it just to podcasting. To tell you the truth, Freddie, I've reached so many more people through the podcast than I do on radio. Radio is okay. a bit of an old technology these days, you know. 
and it's a global yes. audience. Whereas when you're on radio, it's just who's ever tuned in to the radio at the time. Yeah. People are listening to their phones on music and stuff in their cars and Bluetoothing stuff. They're not even listening to the radio much anymore. Mm. And so that was my intention. Uh, and when I moved stations, I, we couldn't have people call in for questions. And so I started interviewing people to share their stories. And I've just been doing that for about nearly 12 years now. And, wow. uh, yeah, and just keep it going. So I, I find that like you probably, the best way to teach people is through story. And so sharing other people's story is me mm. helping, is me teaching but I don't have to Absolutely. do all the talking, right? I can just sit yes. back like you and just ask <laughs> questions and they can do it. <laughs> the, 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 they call it the lazy teacher method. <laughs> yeah, totally. Absolutely. And what's your podcast called? It's and where called do people find it? Accentuate the positive. Like you, it's on all the audio platforms and awesome. YouTube. Yeah, I'm in, cool. I should put it on a few because it's a video podcast as well as an audio podcast. Because uh, I just had this fabulous guy, Australian artist. His name is uh, John Scott. And he had a near-death experience. Well, how many years ago? Well, a long time ago, probably 25 years ago. Uh, that was extensive. And he's tried to, when I say tried, he, he, he uses his memory of his experience in his art. And his art is beautiful. So it's timeless like the, that. And then I had another guy on the show recently called uh, Darrell who takes as a spirit photographer and he takes photographs of energy and orbs and oh, wow. spirit and, oh, he's amazing. So it's times like that where the visuals really helping because I show their art or I show their photography. Okay. And I say to my yeah. audio listeners, I'm sorry, but you'll have to go to YouTube to see this because you really yeah. get a better idea of what I'm talking about by seeing the visual. So I, I think the visual is, you know, important as well to have that visual and, um, awesome. as well as the audio a lot of, lots of people yeah. love the audio because they can listen in the car or listen on a walk or yes. you know, they don't have to be looking at a screen they can mm. just listen. but sometimes the visual comes in handy as well yeah wonderful and now the last question is where do people find you on 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 on, on the big world wide web where do we log in to listen to you to see you to read about you to read your books it's all, it on, <laughs> it's all on karenswain.com, just my name, dot .com, awesome. karenswain, K-A-R-E-N-S-W-A-I-N.com. Um, that website's Fantastic. so old now. I've had it for so many years and there's so much information. So there's hundreds of podcasts. There's movies. I used to make little mind movies. There's oh, wow. articles. There's, oh, look, there's yeah, there's heaps. I write She's articles. She's a busy woman. <laughs> Channeling, yeah. So it's all there that's yeah. wonderful Karen awesome. Swain so karenswain.com karen from the bottom of my heart i thank you so much for your time and your amazing lovely fabulous energy i had so much fun oh me and, too um, freddie it's been gorgeous yeah, meeting it was, you it was really good what a, what a fabulous way cats. to start my day and, and hopefully for you for uh, um to end your day yeah the yeah. little gray one i'm taking to the vet later on because i think it's got a a sore tooth because whenever I scratch him, he pulls away. So let's just go and have that checked out. There's no reason for him to suffer. But so what, thank you so much. What time yes. is it over there for you now at the moment? It is now 10 o'clock, just past 10 in the morning. Beautiful. So it's what, 8 o'clock at night where you are? 7. Yeah, just past 7. seven. Oh, cool. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, have a wonderful evening and thank you again. And I will send you, no, I don't have to because you've got the recording. But I will let you know when it goes live mm. so that I'll send you the link anyway. Do with it whatever you feel you want to. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Look after yourself. Bye-bye.